Make it so. Make it so. Make, make, make it so. Make it so. And now, making it so with Mike Mann and Josh Bald. Hello and welcome to Making It So. My name is Mike Mann. And with me, as always, Josh Bald. Hey everybody, Josh Bald here. Uh, I have to say, Mike and I, both a little jittery, both a little excited in an yes. appropriate way. We just spoke for an hour with Melinda Snodgrass and it was, uh, I don't know, Mike, it was revealing, it was fun, it was uh, enlightening, and I just had a great time talking to her. Yeah, yeah, I did too. And uh, revealing was right. Um, you know, it's not every day that you get to talk to a writer um, who's been in Hollywood for so long and who's also written uh, so many books. I mean, God. Right. Uh, so she's done kind of both worlds there in the writing track and had so much information and uh, so and- many... And was honest and got and didn't yeah. have to be diplomatic and apologize for anything. She, boy, Melinda Snodgrass, she knows what she likes. Uh, she knows what works and doesn't work, and uh, she will let you know if it didn't work. Yeah, man, really cool. Really cool to hear uh, <laughs> from just a great career, and she's still going so strong. She's got this new show that's coming out. Uh, not they're not even filming yet they're still working on it it's uh wild cards and uh it sounds awesome it's and those based are based on, on her books correct book series that she's done with george R. R. martin um and that's uh been going on for i think 20 years this wild card series maybe more even wow i could be wrong but yeah they've done it uh for a long time um, and don't worry folks we talk trek we talk her famous oh, yeah. of a man episode we talk about a couple other episodes she was involved in and her experiences working with a lot of people boy she dropped names left and right it was fascinating <laughs> well i mean they're just <laughs> it's dropping names to the likes of you and me but to her it's just people that she worked with yeah it does you know go, oh i know that guy the guy right. the yeah i've heard that name before the wow. guy that shepherded this series into oh my goodness yeah exactly <laughs> Uh, it's like, oh, the Maurice Hurley? <laughs> <laughs> she calls him Maury. Well, you know, she earned it. Yeah, she knows him. <laughs> so, I knew him. Well, folks, well, I'm going to press play uh, right about now. If we ever get our stuff together, we'll have a really cool sound effect for when it's time to press play. You never know. Something yeah. like that. No, nah, uh, not that. <laughs> no. No, I'll just straight steal it from Trek Core and everybody will be happy. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> All right, folks, enjoy our conversation with Melinda Snodgrass. That is true. Uh, they, I usually get permission to take the manuscript back and put it away, though. Is uh, oh. I'm kidding around. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to write a million words before we write good words. I mean, that, that's the sort of old saw that is in the community. It's like, you got to write your million words before you're ready to really write, and like, okay, <laughs> that's a lot of words. Yes, it is. Well, hello and welcome to Making It So, a conversation about Star Trek with those who help create it. Our guest today has studied opera in Vienna, practiced law in New Mexico, and created worlds across the pages of her multiple book series. On television, you've seen her work on shows such as The Profiler, The Outer Limits, and yes, Star Trek The Next Generation. She's currently back in the writer's room, executive producing and writing on the Hulu adaptation of the Wild Cards series that she also co-edits with George R.R. Martin. Did I mention she's also an accomplished Jashaj equestrian? (laughs) Our guest probably does more before breakfast than I do all week. We are thrilled to welcome to Making It So, Melinda M. Snodgrass. Hello, Melinda. How are you? I'm fine and delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you so much. We just are thrilled that you uh, decided to join us, and we have so much to ask you, so many questions. Um, Gosh, you have written so much, and uh, as Josh kind of uh, (laughs) alluded to in the beginning, uh, we both have aspired to write at various points in our lives and have given up on that dream or postponed it, perhaps, for another day. I myself am a stay-at-home dad at the moment, uh, not writing maybe 
as I should be during the downtimes. <laughs> but uh, it's hard to find downtime uh, when raising a little one. In fact, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my, my trick was always um, finding the uh, encouragement to keep going once I hit the initial wall. I would have a spark of something and be so into it and go, go, go for, you know, a few weeks and then I would hit a wall and I would let it go and let it languish and I would never return to it and I've got a graveyard of projects that started that way and died um, and I go back and look at them sometimes and some of them are half good and some of them aren't um, but I wonder as someone who has seen so many projects through uh, to the end and is continuing to work on so many how do you find that drive, and where does that spark come from for you? Uh, well, I think <clears throat> I think that's a common thing. I, I had a friend who was, frankly, a far better wordsmith than I am, who had a filing cabinet filled with brilliant first five chapters and, <laughs> you know, nothing else. I, I mean, I think part of it is I actually think my legal training helped because there is a certain... You know, the court doesn't care if you're having a bad day. You have to get the brief in on time. And I think that sort of helped with the discipline aspect of it. But I think the other factor is that I outline. Um, I believe firmly in outlining. I know I'm not supposed to say that. I'm supposed to say every writer comes to their work in a different way. And that's true. But if you're writing to deadline, <clears throat> I really think that being an architect, as George calls it, is the best way to do that. And so before... I ever sit down to start writing, uh, you know, if I get an idea, then I sit down and the first thing I figure out is what's the final scene, what's the final climactic moment ah. of the book or the script or whatever it is. And if I don't know what that is, it's probably not a good idea and it's probably not going to work. Huh. Um, but if I know, if I can see that, I mean, things usually start for me with a character that I go, huh, that's an interesting character. How do they end up in this interesting situation? And then I go, okay, what's the final scene? What's the final journey for this person? And once I have that, then I sit down and start outlining. And I outlined even before I came to Hollywood, because I did novels and then segued out here. But how we break a story in Hollywood has been the most useful thing, and I use it not only on scripts, but I use it on books as well. And so I break my novels into a teaser and three acts. And then the first thing I do, I use a cork board with three by five, different colored three by five cards, and sometimes different colored pins if I don't have different colored cards. And I put up the teaser, act one, act two, act three, act four, you know, act three, and then I go and I write on a card that final climactic scene and I pin it on the board. And then I figure out what the big act out is for act two and act one. Sometimes the teaser will come in there sooner and I put that up. It is so much easier to plot backwards because if you know where you have to get to, you know the scenes you need to get there. Huh, sure. And so I really, really think that that's a help. And <clears throat> it also saves you a lot of time where you end up going down false, false pathways that are just going to lead you into a swamp and then you have to back back out. I mean, people who are, George calls it gardening. He says he's a gardener. I'm an architect. Another word for it is being a pantser. I write by the seat of my pants. <laughs> the problem with that is that, you know, you can end up 100 or 200 pages down this false pathway, find yourself in the swamp, and go, well, that was a waste of 200 pages. So I tend to <clears throat> do the outline first. And that just makes, then when I get up in the morning and I go in, get my coffee, sit down at the computer, I just look at the outline and I know what scene it is I'm supposed to write today. Um, now, obviously, with a novel, I don't put up every scene because, you know, it's going to be 100,000 words and I can't, you know, I'd have to have five boards. But I put in the major scenes, the big sort of tentpole scenes, and then, and, and then I sort of know what are the interstitial scenes that help get there. If you're doing a screenplay, you literally have every scene laid out on your board. Right. Um, I, I don't know how comedy writers do it. That is a whole other world. But in drama, that's what we do. And we know we're going to have to write, you know, for network televisions, about 47 pages. For the streaming services, you have more leeway. You can go 55, 57, 
maybe even 60 pages if it shoots fast. If you're Aaron Sorkin, you can probably write a 70-page script because everybody's <laughs> talking very and walking through hallways and you know doing all the things that are known for being the Sorkin, you know, uh -huh. just how he operates. But but that's uh, <clears throat> that's the difference between plotting a novel versus plotting a screenplay. Did you Sorry, find that was a very long answer? <laughs> no, it's wonderful. It's uh, quite revealing. Uh, my follow up would be: Do you find? Did you find when you started plotting out your novels in the TV way, I, for lack of a better term, did you uh, did you find you were the only person doing that, or did you find that uh, other novelists were doing something similar? I hadn't. I haven't found any that do it quite that way. And in fact, when I took a break from Hollywood and came back home to, to New Mexico to Santa Fe, I brought back the plot break and introduced it to my writers group that included George and Daniel Abraham and Walter John Williams, and, you know, very eclectic group of writers. And then um, it really worked out well because then we, we formed little tiny mini writer rooms. Somebody would say, hey, I need to plot my new, my new epic fantasy and uh, let's gather at somebody's house with the boards and I'll buy lunch or dinner for everybody and we spend the whole day and we all work it out just as if we were in a writer's room in Hollywood and we all loved it and, and uh, a, <clears throat> a lot of my friends are still doing that um, of the New Mexico Mafia we do tend to still work that way I think Walter John just had a plot break on, on, a, on a new Praxis book just a few weeks ago. Unfortunately, I'm not there, so I don't get to take part anymore, but I, I love them. Of course, I'm getting to do it in a writer's room for a TV show, so it, it's okay. Yeah, so how much of that writer's room experience is that kind of collaborative, like you said, plot breaking, um, and how much of it is kind of individual writing? And is it is it different these days versus your days back writing on track? No, it's not different at all. And, okay. Uh, I, I, I love it to be in a room with a lot of very bright, very creative, very talented people and to p bounce ideas and to discuss and to say, okay, what is the emotional content of this story that we're trying to tell or this particular scene? You know, why is it, what's not working? You know, what's this person's journey? So that it isn't all about plot, so that it's about the emotion. Um, it is exhausting and exhilarating, and I just I love it more than I can express. And so you actually work as a group. Um, we were what we've just finished is sort of the overview of the first season for the first show, and now and we have you know the broad strokes of the upcoming episodes. But then after we you know the studio and the network are hopefully happy, <laughs> we will then go back and really bore down on these individual episodes and lay them out scene by scene, act by act, scene by scene. And then we will send our people off, you know, okay, you're going to write episode two and, you know, I'm going to write episode three or what, you know, we, we assign it and then people go off and write. Um, and then we all read the scripts and have our input. But, uh, you know, our showrunner, uh, Andrew Miller, will, you know, have the final say if he likes you know, whatever his note is, that's probably the one. And then, of course, the studio will have notes, and the network will have notes, and, you know, it, it's the nature of the business. Um, if you can't stand to have your work touched or be rewritten or have to take a lot of notes, Hollywood is not the place for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> be a novelist. Right. I uh, When I was writing as an undergraduate, that's what I struggled with because I – maybe romanticize the idea that I would be the lonely writer in my room churning all this out uh, versus meeting guys at the Foxhead bar and talking about writing and banding about ideas. I went the other way and I realized, oh, writing is such a collaborative process, even if only one person's name is on it. Yes, for, certainly for television. I, I don't know if that's the case for novels. I mean, the plot breaks that we do, we're cl clearly collaborative, but ultimately it's kind of you putting your butt in the chair for hours, you know, for however many hours doing the work. Um, I mean, being a novelist is essentially a very lonely life, um, and you have to be okay with that. Um, I, I think we all tend to be, we all seem to have very vivid lives, uh, you know, imagination uh, and lives that we live in these alternate worlds that we create. And so I never felt lonely. I was an only child, and I read voraciously, and I made up stories, and apparently I wrote plays for the neighborhood kids when I was a little kid, which I don't actually remember much about, but <laughs> my mom told me that. Um, and, you know, I think we're happy 
in our worlds with the people we create. But if you if you kind of can't stand that alone time, again, probably not a great career for you. And then then maybe television or movie you know <laughs> would be a better choice. Well, how do you feel between the two? Do you are you're kind of just getting back into the television game? It feels like, and it sounds like you're kind of really digging it. I actually prefer it. Um, I'm a decent novelist. I, I think I'm pretty good. People like my books, and you know they buy the publishers buy them. Um, this sounds really arrogant. I think I'm a very good screenwriter. I think I was born to be a screenwriter because for me, less is more, and I love dialogue. Um, periodically in the writers group when I would turn in my my pages for a novel I was working on the usual note was as always fabulous dialogue where are they <laughs> <laughs> sure. and so um, because description bores me especially you know books with the oh and here we are riding through the waving fields of grain and now it's the misty Ma okay um, I'm like okay get back to the people and what are they feeling and what are they saying and and so I think really um, my skill set is better suited for for writing for screen and then writing novels but I still enjoy both I mean I just finished writing for and editing the uh, upcoming wild cards book so and and uh, you know I still love it but but that was a very collaborative experience because it was one of our mosaic novels so there were four other writers and then me and I made them go through a Hollywood plot break on Skype and I laid out and made a master outline so everybody knew what their characters had to do to tell the story um, and then I got to you know write my stuff and so it was really fun I mean it was a grand time doing that okay fun so you got to kind of be the executive producer of that session I did <laughs> <laughs> and all my writers were like is this what you do in Hollywood? And I was like, yes. And they were like, this is cool. <laughs> I a writer in Northern Ireland, a writer outside of London, oh, Austin, wow. Chicago, and me. <laughs> and we said it. We, we made the time thing work, and we did right. two and a half hours on Skype doing. Isn't that, that cool Skype. that you can do that online now? Yes. Oh my God. Yes. It's the most amazing world that we live in now. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So well, I have a I have a follow up question for when you, you're talking about writing about television and or sorry writing for television and writing dialogue. Do you find that you rely mostly on your dialogue and don't write a lot of direction in the brackets parentheses italics? I don't even know how you do it. Uh, yes. Um, well, for one thing, there's going to be a set designer you know who's going to come in and create the. They just need to know you know is it a bedroom? Is it a, a cafeteria? You know wh where are you? Um, so I tend not to go into deep, deep uh, descriptions of what's in there unless it's going to be critical in like an upcoming fight sequence. When I when I design a fight, I usually have Jackie Chan in the back of my head. <laughs> like, what can I put in this scene that will make for an interesting fight? And if there's something I want to be used, then I may mark it. But normally, I'm I'm pretty spare in what I say in in um, in my my scene directions. And I focus on the dialogue, and also when executives are reading your script, or you know, for that matter, actors, most of them never read those descriptions. They're just reading the dialogue because they read hundreds of scripts. They don't have time, and if they can't follow it and, and be invested in it based on just the dialogue, you're not going to sell it, or it's not going to work for them. Um, so you know, you have to make sure that, that the, the actors and their dialogue are going to carry this story. Right. Oh, good to know. You know, and you know when I start writing for TV. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> well, you know, knock on wood. You never it know. And there's something I wanted to bring up, which um, is something in your dialogue that actually I don't know if you're aware because, as I heard in a different podcast, you never watched uh, Star Trek The Next Generation beyond the third season when you left. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. <laughs> Um, I can't tell you anything about any other Trek show or anything about Trek after the third season. Wow. And that's that's amazing to me because there's so much of, of just what you wrote has carried on. Um, I know you wrote the first poker scene into Trek, and the yeah. whole show ends on a poker scene. 
Yes. <laughs> I, I'm sure I, you've I, been told that. I, I heard about that. I was like, <laughs> glad you all like the poker scene. <laughs> <laughs> um, but also, I was going to tell you that uh, w your dialogue in that episode, there's this wonderful, uh, lovely scene in Instance of Command, which is a whole other thing I wanted to Instance talk to you. Yeah, in the Instance of Command, um, which I also wanted to speak to uh, you about your original script um, a little bit. Um, but there's a lovely scene there where Troy is talking to Picard about the difficulty of language between species. Mm -hmm. um, and she's saying, if you were on another planet and uh, you had to describe what this is to somebody, you know, um, how would it go? And uh, later, <laughs> there's a whole episode based on that very premise. <laughs> Which is one of the most uh, favorited episodes of all time. It's called Darmok, and it's uh, listed as people's favorite episode, which I think you should get credit for. <laughs> that, that's very nice, but I think the writer who wrote it should <laughs> ultimately have the credit. So. Fair, fair. They, uh, so there was, yeah, that's an interesting thing. The, the script for Instance of Command is uh, on your website, and I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and wh why the script is there uh, as opposed to the uh, version that we saw aired. It was frustrating for me. I, I, other than that one script, um, I have never been rewritten. I've never been rewritten on any show um, other than that one time on track. And it was a whole series of issues of people misunderstanding um, what I was doing. Mm. <laughs> being accused of making data emotional when in fact I did absolutely no such thing and uh, it was a fraught time because the forgotten man of Star Trek Michael Wagner who was actually our executive producer for all of six weeks before he quit and he quit because of what happened with that script um, and I loved Michael dearly he was a wonderful brilliant writer who sadly died at 46 from a brain tumor and so he's just been written out of Trek history, um, but uh, it was it was tough, and um, you know they they rewrote, and I you know I decided to have my Harlan Ellison moment, and I thought you know he has his version, he had his version of City on the Edge of Forever that he managed to put out there, and I thought I'm going to do the same thing, I'm going to let people see what I wrote versus you know what got shot, and and you know. Um, Ricky and Hans tried to be respectful, and I think overall they were, but I still feel that my script was frankly better <laughs> than what was ultimately shot. Um, and so I just thought I would put it up there for people to read and, uh, and see what can happen, you know, see the changes. So that's why, that's why I did it. Great. It was a little bit arrogant. It was also a, you know, spit in your eye kind of thing from me, but, uh, you know... I, I was at least more polite about it than Harlan ever was about City on the <laughs> And I wanted to tell Harlan bluntly that uh, DC Fontana's version was better than his. So, <laughs> Well, I, uh, I at least I agree that your version was better than the version that aired. Um, and I can say that truthfully because I, I did read yours uh, online and, and watched it. And uh, uh, several of the story problems that I kind of had watching it uh, I'm like, oh, they're not really there in this version, and um, we get to see more of kind of Data's journey of command and how he struggles with that, uh, and ultimately his decision there. Plus, you know, I mean, I hate to spoil it for any Bunby, but <laughs> yeah. Data, Data gets laid. <laughs> oh, God. Just, oh, God. <laughs> no, I, I had never intended for that. Um, I wanted to do Shane you know, a version of Shane for okay. this young woman. I wanted the idea that this mysterious stranger comes to town who is so interesting and so different from what she's experienced and that, you know, she does fall for him, which confuses him utterly, you know, and he's trying to deal with all of these issues. Um, and I got the directive uh, from Gene that he was fully functional in every way and he wanted him to get laid. Um, so... I then had to go and figure out how I got a robot to logically reach the conclusion that they should have sex with this human woman. Um, and that was where the, where the issue started. They were like, you're making data emotional. And I was like, I am not. He is making a logical analysis through that entire okay. thing yeah. to get him 
get him to go to bed with her. But at no point does emotion enter into this. But that was exciting. Uh, you know, so, he walks, he walks uh, through it very logically. He says, you know, does this give you happiness? Would continuing this continue to give you happiness? And she keeps saying yes, yes. And he's very respectful during it. Yeah, I mean, but but he's sort of like, you know, whatever. <laughs> right, <laughs> but it's very detached, it. right? Yeah, it's all just that you are upset. If I do this, will it? Will you stop this behavior? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, and... But you know, it was it was frustrating, and um, yeah. So that that's why you know, Data had to get laid. Um, right. I love Data because I thought he was the most interesting character because he could actually be make mistakes and be, have flaws, and nobody else had any flaws, and so they were really kind of boring. I think it's very ironic that that the robot was sort of the most interesting character on a show, but I loved writing about him, and I wanted to write it finish off with a triptych. I always wanted to write a third episode about Data where he actually has to premeditate and commit a murder. Um, oh, wow. I never That's fascinating. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> maybe someday I'll do a book with a robot and figure out, you know, tell that story. But, um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed writing. And Brent was wonderful. Um, I was fortunate in, you know, and measure of having great actors and a really good director. And I was just, you know, he was he was great to write for for that reason. So. Mm-hmm. I know Mike really wants to dive into these uh, episodes, as do I. But I want to go back to something that you said. Uh, you, you talked about uh, your current showrunner. You know whether they. You said whether they like it. Um, and I know there's more to it than that. But that idea of giving up creative control. It sounds like with this episode we were just talking about, you really didn't have much. Uh, what about the experience of writing your other Trek episodes and for other? Uh, television shows uh, what is that like for you and uh, you said you know this was the one that got rewritten uh, what's that experience like or that process like well you know because it's you know there's 20 odd people plus the actors plus the director I mean there's a lot of things that that go into this budget is a huge issue um, right. things get changed that you know you you kind of wish you have a version and when you go into that production meeting and the production crew says, well, we can't afford to build this or we can't shoot this, and then you start cutting scenes. I mean, you know, but you're making the choices. That's the difference between being rewritten versus, you know, you're sitting production meeting, you're saying, okay, we can't do this or this is going to run over. Um, we need to make some cuts because it's running long. I mean, measure came out to be 13 minutes longer than oh, the wow. airtime. Uh, which is why there is the extended version on the Blu-ray that has all the missing scenes. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I had never done this before, so and nobody really understood that that, that particular script was going to run long. But, you know, all those other issues come into it. Um, you know, when I was on Reasonable Doubts, there were just certain things that you, after a while you learned, okay, don't don't write that. Um, for a particular actor because they're going to have trouble with that line. Um, so all of that is plays into it. And then the director is going to come in and, you know, have issues and opinions. And um, so it, it is very collaborative, and you have to be willing to, you know, bend to what has to happen. So, um, and that affects the outcome you know, on scripts that, uh, and, and also Trek was like terrible at going on location. They just sucked. Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> I was yeah. I was gonna say like you you might have wanted a a scene to take place in a giant cornfield, and they said we can't do that. So you're going back and okay, it'll take place in a bathroom or something. Yeah, exactly. I mean that that kind of thing you know happened a lot. They just it was just not a skill set that that particular show had. Now reasonable doubts. You know the guys would run out the door and go, yeah, we're looking for a porn shop today, and then we're going to go find a church. And you were like, okay. <laughs> and uh, and and they were very good at it. I mean, yeah, we use the Warner Brothers lot a lot for things, but we, you know, they they didn't have any problem at all. They just pack up and off they go, and you know, shoot in downtown L.A. or wherever. Um, but Trek was had some real issues, so it it did end up becoming quite limited. And then you were just what you can build and what it looks like and. Uh-huh. You know, and, did, and cut, cuts, cuts. <laughs> did you feel like you had to compromise uh, anything or or lose something you really loved from any of those episodes because of those limitations? I, you know, I, I mean, I have to be honest. It's been a long time. So oh, sure. I can't, 
you know, I can't really all, um, you know, there's, there are some scripts that I wish had come out better, but we always do. I mean, you know, it's television, and, and when you're doing 22 on the air, it's, it's a killer. I mean, I love, love, love this new paradigm where we have streaming shows where it's 10 or 13 episodes, and you can sit down, plan out the entire season, you know, have it an arc for it, and then write them, shoot them, and then they drop them so people can binge. I mean, that's a huge change of how people watch and absorb media now. Totally. Uh, but when you're when you've got that every week, you know, we got to have 22 episodes, and you're it feels like you're laying track for a train that's about obviously <laughs> behind you. Um, <laughs> And so the network experience is very different from this, this new way that we operate. Um, and so I think it gets a lot harder for shows to keep quality when, when you're just like, oh, God, what are we going to do for episode 17? And, and I, I now have a, a, a sort of shorthand. If I see a show that the next episode is Rashomon or It's a Wonderful Life <laughs> or a, somebody's in a coma and they're having memories of things, I know the show has gotten in trouble. Right. Like, yeah. Oh crap! This this script didn't come in on time. Oh no! Oh, this script is bad. What are we gonna do? Oh, quick! Let's do Rashomon. <laughs> let's do right. Wonderful Life. Um, and so I think that you know that that's just inevitable when when you're doing um, network TV. Those kind of money saving, time saving measures when you're up against it. Yeah. No, I mean, it, you know, it's like, oh, I mean, we were so excited because we were looking up at the board on, on wild cards and went, oh, this is almost a bottle show. Yay! It's going to be cheaper than, than some of these others. Um, but, I mean, Measure of a Man was a, was a quintessential bottle show. Um, sure. Even though I, you know, it wasn't that I particularly set out to do that. And at the time, I didn't even know what a bottle show was because I didn't know from Hollywood. But, um, you know, that, that saved them a ton of money. Oh, no wonder yeah. they brought you back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, that's always, uh, like you said, that's always a consideration. Uh, Mike, do you want to dive into some of these episodes then? Well, no, yeah, um, about Measure the Man, I just was kind of curious um, what research you kind of did going into that uh, as it was a spec script. I'm sure uh, most people probably know, but some may not, that you wrote that script on spec. You weren't part of the writing staff uh, when you wrote Measure of a Man. If you could tell uh, a little bit about maybe your research process there and, and how you decided to write that script. Okay, well, it all started with George R. R. Martin. Um, George had gone off to Hollywood, and George and I were buddies and um, doing wild cards and other stuff together, and then George got the opportunity to go out to Hollywood and work first on the new Twilight Zone, and then he went on to Beauty and the Beast, and uh, one day he called me from California, and uh, he said, Hey, Snod, um, I think you'd be really good at this screenwriting thing, because you write really strong dialogue, and you're that outliner person, and they do a lot of that outlining thing here. And uh, if you want to write a spec script, I will show it to my agent. And I was like, wow, okay, sounds cool. Um, and I had encouraged George to take the plunge when they offered him the job on Twilight Zone. He called me and said, do you think I should do it? And I was like, oh, yeah, you know, even if it's only 10 weeks, what a great experience. So now he's out in Hollywood. So I looked around at what, and oh, let me back up. He gave me this lecture. He said, you will never, ever, ever, ever sell your spec script. Nobody sells your spec script. is just a calling card. And at the time, you wrote a spec, and then hopefully they invited you in, and then you got to pitch more ideas to the show. And normally you never sent a spec script to the show it was written for. You would send it to a sort of adjacent style show rather than the show itself because often the spec script for a particular show it doesn't hit the mark and it doesn't see it doesn't work as well. So anyway, I looked around. I said, "Well, I could write for LA Law, but it looks too intricately plotted." And because I had been an attorney, and then I thought about writing. I didn't want to write for Beauty and the Beast because I thought that was unfair to George and put him on the spot. So I just and I grew up on you know when I was a kid on old Trek and I loved it. And I thought, well, I'll do this new Trek show, give it a try. So I watched, I recorded some episodes, I watched them obsessively, I began to speak the dialogue. I have done a lot of acting too, stage work, 
And um, I began to say the dialogue with them to get the rhythm of how oh. these people spoke. Um, and then I thought, and Data is the most interesting character. And then I reached into my legal education, and I said, um, I can take the Dred Scott decision which was an infamous Supreme Court decision that ruled that a runaway slave was not a person but the property of his owner and had to be returned. And I thought, I can apply that to data very easily because right. he's just a toaster. So right. I, um, I then sat down and began to work out the, the outline and work on the script. And then another friend of mine who was an aspiring writer, he was a retired Navy aviator. And we were talking over lunch, and I told him about this spec I was writing, and he gave me the piece that made it perfect. He said to me, did you know that when a ship is at sea and they are beyond the reach of a JAG office, the captain always defends and the first officer always prosecutes? Oh, so that's oh. straight out of maritime law. Yes. And you know, I knew I had the constitutional stuff because that was sort of my specialty in law school. Uh -huh. But I, this was something I did not know. And I was like, oh, my goodness, holy heck, that's perfect, you know, because uh, I can pit Picard and Riker against each other because that was one of the things that I thought the show lacked, which was a sense of, I mean, the old Trek, I love those moments where Kirk and, Picard, uh, Kirk and Picard, Kirk and Spock and McCoy would debate, would have right. disagreements, were not always in sync. Everybody on on Next Generation just loved each other so much and I was like well crud and I wanted that tension so um, well little did you know you were probably getting around one of Gene's rules right oh yeah I was definitely getting around one of Gene's rules <laughs> by getting around it so anyway I wrote the spec and uh, I gave it to George who gave it to his agent and then the writer strike hit and everybody went on strike for six months and I completely forgot about it. And I stayed in New Mexico writing my books. And then I got a phone call from George saying, my agent sent that script to Trek, and they want to see you. Wow. I was like, oh, my God. So I then the next, I got some of the best writing advice I've ever gotten, which came from George. I said to him, well, actually, I, I, this would happen before I wrote Measure. I said to him, You've told me I won't sell this script and that hopefully I have to take it, but maybe I should save this script in order to use it for my pitch if I get a meeting. And George said to me, never hoard your silver bullet, which is why I wrote Measure. I led with the very best thing I could write rather than writing a, you know, maybe less good, you know, or less interesting script. Right, right. So they bought it. Um, Morris bought, Maury Hurley bought the script. Um, when I turned up for my pitch session, um, he asked about my background. We talked for a while. I told him I had some pitches prepared, and then he put his finger to his lips and he shushed me <laughs> and he pointed at the whiteboard that was over his head. And I'm a very small person, so I tend not to look up that much. <laughs> Things over my head are completely invisible. Um, and so I, there was a list of the upcoming shows to be shot, and there was Measure of a Man. <sighs> list. Um, so they bought it, and um, and I floated into George's office at Beauty and the Beast. If I think it's yeah. around, he says, and uh, I went home to Mexico. And I thought, wow, I've sold the script. Um, and then Gene called me because <laughs> Maury thought it would give me a thrill since I was a Trek girl, and Gene proceeded to blow up the script <laughs> because <laughs> he told me that there were no lawyers in the 24th century. <laughs> And that data would be delighted to be taken apart. <laughs> oh, and, great. <laughs> and I said, well, Mr. Roddenberry, then we don't have a script. <laughs> and then when Maury found out, he said, can you come back, please, <laughs> to L.A.? <laughs> so I flew back to L.A., and I sat in a notes meeting with Maury, and uh, he gave me notes and told me things like, the teaser you have won't work. You have to come up with a new teaser. And we spent three hours with me coming up with solutions. And at the end of the three hours, Maury said, I'm hiring you. You start on Monday. And that wow. was Thursday. So that launched my Hollywood career. That's but incredible. All due to George. <laughs> Although George keeps saying, but you're the one who wrote the script and did the work. And, and that is true. But it would never have occurred to me if I hadn't had a friend to, you know, 
give me that support and give me that opportunity by talking to his agent and saying, hey, you know, take a chance on her. Um, networking actually works. You know? Yeah. Well, um, I, we should we should thank George and, and hope he hits a big someday, too. Yeah, <laughs> we have high hopes for the man. <laughs> right. Whatever happened to that young man? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. And so when, when he hired you, was that as that was that a staff writer position? What was that position? I was hired as a story editor, which was nice. I didn't have to come in at the lowest level. I mean, the irony of Hollywood is if the word writer is in your title, you are the lowest of the low. <laughs> You want to get away from having writer in your title um, as soon as possible. So it's staff writer, story editor, co-producer, and then, you know, there's like consulting producer and supervising producer and all these sort of weird middle things, and then co-exec producer and then executive producer. Um, so, but yeah, they hired me in at the second level, entry level, of story editor. Um, and that was nice because I, I meant I got paid for my scripts because if you're just a staff writer, you only get paid a salary. You don't get paid for any scripts you write. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah, okay. it's scripts. It's scripts above, and uh, and so it's it's a different it's a different payment schedule through the WGA. Were there different uh, responsibilities that came as story editor too? Were you looking at other uh, other people's scripts? Uh, I'm, I guess I don't know what a story editor does. Well, we uh, we do. Um, we all read any scripts that came in. We read each other's scripts. We were in the room. Ira Bear, was, I mean, I loved Ricky and Hans, but Ira Bear was really a mentor to me. I love that guy. Um, I learned so much from him. Uh, he was a co-exec. Maybe he was only a supervisor. I don't remember what Ira's title was, but he was great. And we were in the room, you know, in, uh, the writers, um, and and doing, you know, figuring out, upcoming episodes and working through and breaking the stories and then we'd be assigned to go off and write but we did read each other's work so in a sense I I don't know if there was any delineation and you kinda want your younger writers to be part of this entire process because it helps them uh, hone their skills and improve right if they're if they're involved and they can see why changes are made and what happens and so on and so on Sure. Yeah, so those first weeks in that room must have just been quite revealing and eye-opening for you. Oh yeah, no, it was it was uh, it was great to see something I sort of knew how to do in a vague way, my outlining, to be taught how to do it with this level of of detail. I mean, we used whiteboards and multicolored pens on Trek, and I got to tell you, the trick of having assigning a different color to each character is just enormously helpful because if you look at your board and you see one of the colors drop out, you realize you've lost track of the character. Oh, that's so smart. It's so smart. I mean, I was just like, this is brilliant. Wow, you know. Um, and, and if you're doing novels and you can't make somebody stay, it often indicates you don't need that character. Right. You know, that character just doesn't need to be there. But when you're doing a show and you know that the actors have X many episodes guaranteed, you kind of, I mean, that's how Whoopi ended up in Measure of a Man. She wasn't initially in it. And then they looked at her contract and said, oh, we're not going to make her contract if we don't put her in this episode. So I had to come up with a whoopee scene and, you know, turned out to be one of the best scenes in the entire thing. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that certainly elevated, I think, the whole thing, that scene. Yeah, and I had three hours to write that. It was exciting. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Go away well, talk about grace under pressure. Yeah, well, that that's Hollywood. I mean, that, again, that's sort of, it's like, and especially when you're doing the sort of network grind it's um it's like go 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 get it done <laughs> do you individually feel like you thrive under that kind of deadline pressure yes um i like deadlines i think deadlines are your friend um i think if you don't have them um it's just awfully easy to say well i'm just not feeling it today <laughs> <laughs> yeah the muse is not speaking to me and um and to walk away and when you you know, and I know I have a book contract or a script due. It's like, okay, and I, I set goals. I do. Uh, I treat if if I'm doing a novel, it's a thousand words a day, which is four pages. Surprising how quickly that adds up to become a book. Wow. And for a screenplay, I do seven pages. Huh. And if That's you do, some dedication. Yeah, just you know, if you just do that, you have something before. And you know, obviously, if I'm having a great day, I'll go past the thousand words or past the seven pages, especially when I'm coming up on the end of something. 
very exciting when you're rolling toward the climax. Or as Ricky used to say, when we're running for the credits. <laughs> you know, like, wow, we're running for the credits. Um, so then you, you do that. Do you, can you describe that? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to recollect. Uh, I, I remember that feeling when you were ru- running towards the credits, which is a phrase I've never heard before. I love it. I, I remember when I was writing and I was really in a groove. I, I just, it was a great feeling. I, I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Like what's, what's going in your head at that uh, moment when you really hit that stride? It's a complete high. I mean, I find it, it's just like an endorphin high. It's like after a good workout at the gym or a really great ride on one of my horses. It's just like, and, and you're, you're, you're in the experience with the character. You know, it's just, you feel like you're just one with that person and you feel inseparable. And it's like you're experiencing it every step of the, the adventure as you, you know, Reach the Dunamon. I mean, I I have cried when I've killed characters. <laughs> I, mean, I admit, I you know get oh, so wow. into it. I'm like, oh my god, I killed you, <laughs> you know, and then I get teary. Um, <laughs> but but you had to die because it was the right thing to have happen. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, no, that's so meaningful though that you can do that and that that you can still make that choice to do it. You know. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you just you just have to. I mean, that that sort of separates fan writing from. From, from being a, the pro. I mean, it's like, if the story needs this, this, this is what the story is demanding. Yeah. So. Yeah, one of those uh, maxims from my undergraduate years was kill your darlings, and I guess there are a lot of levels to that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I guess I um, had another question about just the general Trek writing. Was there anything about writing on Trek that you found made it unique versus writing other science fiction? Yeah, uh, unique in a bad way. <laughs> it was a fr- huh. friggin' endless techno babble. <laughs> um, you know, I hated it. Um, I just, it was, I mean, uh, poor LeVar, I mean, my God, he had to deliver this gibberish, you know, every week. Um, and, and none of it matters. I mean, I don't care if the Framistat needs more frumium, you know, I, <laughs> I don't care. I don't know if uh, give me Scotty just saying I don't know if the engine can take anymore, Captain. I don't know. <laughs> I don't need to know why they can't take anymore. You know, um, and that was I think one of the most frustrating things about it. Um, Were you then prompted to include that in your script? Is uh, oh yeah, okay. oh my god, yeah. Uh, Rick Berman loved that stuff, <laughs> and um, and I'm sure the actors just wanted to tear their hair out over it. Um, and I just hated it. Um, and, and I think in many ways the dialogue, it, the show was very humor impaired too, at least while I was there. Um, you know, the kind of lightness, people being ironic or being, all of that was gone. Everybody seemed terribly, terribly earnest and sincere all the time. Oh. And, uh, th- those to me were its flaws. Um. I mean, I gotta be honest. To me, yes, the Orville. Sometimes the jokes really don't work, but I much prefer the Orville. To, to me, the Orville is what Trek should have been. Uh huh. That they're taking the swing at least and trying. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I like these people, and they they don't get along, and and they have you know problems I can identify with. You know, guilt and and jealousy, and you know, sexual right. frustration, and you know, whatever right. it is. Um, I, they're allowed I, to be human. Yes, they're allowed to be human, and and everybody on Trek was so freaking perfect that it was deeply, to me, deeply boring and confining. Um, I like people with flaws. I like people who are overcoming their own inadequacies or their own fears uh, if they don't have any of that. And and also the whole Trek universe. I mean, the whole no money thing was like. Yeah. Well, somebody, there has to be something that defines value. Well, this is interesting because you put the poker into the uh, the Trek universe, and I've always wondered what they're betting. Yeah, yeah, me too. (laughs) (laughs) You know, because there are no, listen, here is my sin. If if I had my, if I had to pick a universe to live in, I would far rather live in the Star Wars universe because while there are stormtroopers and Darth Vader and, and pirates and things, it looks like it's a lot more interesting and people have money or want money, credit. They want imperial right. credits and they want to, you know, I, I just, 
I don't understand that. I mean, it's a whole. There were no. There are no lawyers in the 24th century. And me going. I'm sorry, Jean, but even if you assume you can make every criminal's mind right, which is something he thought would come to pass, which I thought was rather creepy, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, you still have to deal with contracts and divorces and you know trade disputes and trade disputes and conflicts of laws between different cultures I mean there is no universe in which there will not be lawyers right um, for better or worse you know it's just the case so you know I, I think in some ways utopias are boring um, I've always wanted I mean I, I really wish I could have done the Trek show I wanted to do the Trek show about you know the people living in the cracks the hairy muds of the universe you know, sure. I wanted to do the show where, for them, the Federation is like a boot on their neck. They're like, oh, God, it's Starfleet. You know? <laughs> oh, no. Right. Um, I wanted to know what their lives were like and, uh, and what that looked like. And, and uh, I feel like, oh, God, I'm talking, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just feel like always having it have to be about a Starfleet ship is a lack of imagination on CBS's part. Sure. I just think there's a big universe that, you know, demands more. Um, I, I, you know, if you don't want to do that, then at least give me Starfleet Academy with a bunch of really bright-eyed 18-year-olds, you know, who get in trouble and cheat and sleep with each other. <laughs> <laughs> well, you may get your wish, Melinda. That that sounds like there's one of the new series in development, uh, maybe from the creators of the OC, a Starfleet Academy series. <laughs> Well, good. <laughs> so, so yeah, you may have your uh, your druthers there. Yeah. They'll definitely be sleeping with each other. Yeah, and and you know, trying to get the answers or copying or whatever, you know. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know. Uh, right. You you definitely pointed to something that uh, Mike and I always go back and forth about our favorite parts, uh, our favorite aspects of Trek, and I. I always come back to Deep Space Nine being my favorite series because it's everything you just pointed to as far as these flawed characters, and the most interesting ones are the non-Federation characters, or the non-Starfleet characters, because they're allowed to have flaws, and they're allowed to have conflict, and it's just so compelling uh, to have that in Trek, and I, I really appreciate you vocalizing that, because that's I can go back to those episodes over and over again and be uh, just satisfied to the same level every single time. Yeah, no, I've heard that, and, and I'm not surprised because that was Ira's show, and Ira was terrific and is terrific, um, and, and he was lucky because everybody took their attention off him and went off to do Voyager, ah. and he was able to just slide in and do, you know, I gather some very compelling stories. I mean, I, I know people are like, you should watch it, and I'm like, I have PTSD, as, as Rick Manning said, Trek puts the T in PTSD, <laughs> and so I just I just can't do it. I mean, I did manage to watch the J.J. Abrams movies, enjoyed the first one, laughed hysterically over the second one, which was god awful. Yep, yeah, fair. <laughs> and uh, and and wanted to like I mean liked parts of the third one because Simon Pegg wrote the script, so it had some life and humor. It had the wrong ending because that was not a Kirk ending. Kirk would have found a way to save that guy, you know. Right. Yeah. And um, and so, but other than that, I thought the third one was a distinct improvement over two, which was I kept laughing the entire time I was watching it. Yeah. I mean, I laughed over the first one too because I I mean I enjoyed it because it felt right and the character I thought the characters captured my favorite guys Spock and Kirk and McCoy in a really great way Scotty, but I, I kept going. You know the pissed off Romulans. Why don't y'all just go home and tell everybody the planet's gonna blow up? Why are you? Yeah, that's a good. Fuck. You know, I was like, what? Um, so that was a momentary problem for me. But I was like, oh well, whatever. They, they obviously are not, you know, thinking straight after their transit through time or something. Um, but I still liked it because at least it, it felt right. It had the right feel. Now, when you went into those movies, uh, I'm curious, were you uh, relating it to your uh, experience watching TOS when you were younger, or what, how were you as a writer? That's so fascinating to me, as a writer, going yeah, into I was, this film. Yeah, I was taking me back to my childhood, and that very first moment when a spaceship went across my television screen, 
I'm old, okay? Um, but, you know, there was like, oh my God, this is the thing I've been dreaming about my entire life. And there was the Enterprise. And I fell in love with those characters, like every little girl. I love Spock. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I love that show. And, and it captured that feeling for me. That, and, and I had the, even more so, the first time I saw Star Wars. And I was studying for the bar exam. Um, so oh. I was like a basket case, and I knew this movie was coming out, and I went to see it with my best friend at the time, Victor Milan, who encouraged me to become a novelist at the, after law school. And um, <clears throat> we stood in line, and they sold out, and they sold out, and then they added a midnight showing. So I didn't actually see Star Wars until like midnight. Oh my gosh. Um, and I loved it so much when that ship came over, and the, all of us went, oh, wow. <laughs> it was just like the greatest thing ever. Um, I've always loved science fiction from the time I was a little girl. I've always wanted a spaceship. Oh. Much prefer it to fantasy. Yeah. Okay. Would you go into space now if you could? Oh, yeah, in a heartbeat. Oh, excellent. Because it's one of, you know, it's coming up one of these days. It's going to be commercial <laughs> flight here. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not getting in in, um, in one of Branson's death traps. Okay. <laughs> uh, but if Elon does it, I'm, I'm in. <laughs> you know, if I had, whatever it is, $3 million or however much it's going to cost. Right, yeah. I, that I don't have. And, I, you know, I'm not sure I could pass the physical anymore. I mean, I'm in good shape, but, you know. Um, space is an unforgiving environment. <laughs> That's so. true. Well, I hope it. Uh, I hope it comes to fruition for you if you get the chance. <laughs> It'd be <laughs> spectacular. Uh, you you just mentioned something. You mentioned uh, that uh, sci-fi was since you were a little girl. That was for you. So when you're when you're getting into the writing world and you're writing science fiction, uh, you mentioned DC Fontana earlier. Uh, she used the initials DC and of course famously JK Rowling used JK uh, mm -hmm. to I would assume because I've read about of course a lot of women especially in science fiction would use their initials was that ever a consideration for you or did you just go for uh, using your full name I just went for using my full name um, I, I think the world had changed enough and um, it, it just you know Hollywood is sexist, no doubt about it, but it's changing. It's it's changing remarkably quickly now uh, in terms of diversity, both gender and race, um, and and um, LGBT. I mean, it's great um, to see to see the changes and the different voices that are coming in. But no, I mean, you know, did it cost me maybe a little bit? Uh, and certainly, there was a tendency when I first got in that. Oh yeah, you should be writing Little House on the Prairie or Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. And I was like, Yeah, no, I don't want to write that. That was actually said to you? Oh yeah. Oh my uh, wow. pushed, you know, t the touch by an angel. No. Um, Gosh. Yeah, then I need to go and report this angel. So it did <laughs> in an inappropriate way. So there was that push and I've always I mean, I did get the reputation of being the chick who writes action. Um because that's what I wanted to write. I wanted to write, you know, let, let me write a Mission Impossible or a Lethal Weapon or, you know, something fun. But overall, I, I don't think it's been a problem. I, I know for other people, you know, their experience may be different than mine. Um, but my dad sort of raised me to push through and certainly in law school as well. Uh, and now women are the majority uh, coming out of law schools at this point. So, you know, it, yeah, it's yeah. definitely changed. Well, that's, that's great. I'm, I'm glad it wasn't a particularly negative experience for you, but, uh, it, you know, you experienced some of it. But, uh, yeah, I'm glad that it wasn't uh, something that held you back at all. I don't think so. I mean, you know, m well, maybe my career would have been farther along. Um, but I also made I made a choice that was probably not the best choice. I, I got on the right TV pilot track, which my agent loved, because if any one of those pilots had been made, we all would have gotten very rich and gone to series. But what happens is when you get off the the staff track, you end up your your group, you know, your cadre moves on without you right. and it's very hard to get back in. And that's what I discovered. And so really the only way for me to get back in was to come in with my own project, which was wild cards, and fight for it and fight that, 
you can't have it unless you make unless I'm involved, you know. Um, and so, but fortunately, I did have, you know, credentials. So uh, Universal was like, okay, <laughs> okay, you can be involved because um, we really want to buy this project, <laughs> this this property, because uh, every all of them are frantically looking for um, for material now. I mean, you know, um, sure. Netflix just bought. Uh, God, what was it they just bought? I'm trying to remember. Well, Apple bought uh, the foundation. Um, Amazon bought Lord of the Rings. Oh, yes, for an ungodly amount. The ungodly amount of money. Um, oh, Netflix bought Narnia. That's what they oh, bought. Oh, okay. Because, of course, they're losing the Marvel right. material back to Disney because Disney's going to have their own streaming network. Yeah, with so many new streaming networks, it's like everyone's just in this mad scramble for content. Yes, exactly. And that's got to be a major difference, as you pointed out, from, say, 30 to 40 years ago where there were four channels or something, you know, depending on where you were. But uh, now with this demand for content, do you feel like uh, writers have more, many more opportunities now and, uh, and better opportunities? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And, and you can find your niche. I mean, we no longer have to get 25 million eyes on something for it to be considered successful. I mean, Mad Men, Mad Men went on and was, you know, this incredible hit, and they range between 800,000 to a million viewers. Wow. Um, but you can target, you're micro-targeting, you know, sadly, the same way that Facebook and Twitter did and that left us in this political mess we're in, um, but you can micro-target to the right audience for this thing, and then, and then it works. Um, and this is the golden age of television, no doubt about it. I mean, this is just, what's out there to watch is just phenomenal, and you can't watch it all, so you pick the things that, that you personally love. Um, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting you use the term uh, micro targeting because I'm thinking of the terms creative freedom, and it, they don't seem to jibe. But at the same time, it seems like they do because there are people that want this certain content, and you mm -hmm. can serve them with that. Yes, and you can. And now we have ways of finding them, and and so that they can say, "Oh, this I love. <laughs> you know, this is my thing," um, and that works. That works so well. Um, you know, I just obviously I'm hoping we find the the perfect niche for for wild cards, but I, I think we will because while there's a lot of superhero shows out there, there are also a lot of cop shows out there, and yet NYPD Blue and The Wire, you know, if you give people something that elevates it, then they're going to stand out, and I think we'll stand out in the plethora of superhero shows as well. Absolutely, I definitely hope so. And Wild Cards is going to be on Hulu, is that correct? That is correct. Oh, yeah. excellent! I have. Do a we have a start date? No, um, we're we're still in the writers' room, you know, doing the laying out the two shows and sure. laying out the seasons. Um, so you know, we don't have any idea of air date or anything like that. But I will be letting people know when, yeah. when we have that info. Oh, that's wonderful! I, I've got one more go stupid ahead. question. Can we end one on a stupid question? <laughs> sure, I love stupid questions. <laughs> I right. may have a good answer, but we'll see. No, this is fine. In the episode, <clears throat> I'm going to put on my nerd voice. <clears throat> oh, no. In, in the episode, Up the Long Ladder, did Worf and Dr. Pulaski end up sleeping together after the Klingon tea ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have no idea. I mean, I never even thought about that. Well, um, it, was, it, it, seemed, it seemed to be implied. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I loved Pulaski. I loved her. Well, Did you like writing for her? I loved writing for her, and I loved Diana. Um, yeah. Yeah, sure. Why not? They oh, should. there it is. It's yeah. canon now. I have a <laughs> Knowing Pulaski, she would have just said, come here, big boy, and thrown him down on the bed. <laughs> I think it would have been all her you know, in that moment. She was a great character. For one thing, she was the best poker player on the, on the Enterprise. Yeah, she took them all to task. <laughs> that, that's delightful. That tickles me. Now I can watch that with so much more subtext. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melinda, thank you so much for joining us. God, it's been so fun. Thank you. I had a great time. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah, it was a wonderful conversation. Everybody out there be looking for wild cards. Go to melindasnodgrass.com. There's all kinds of great stuff there. I was reading your blog, and that quote from Faulkner was... 
uplifting and inspiring at the same time about uh, the conflict of a man in his heart. So yes, that was really yes. great. Always keep that in mind when you're writing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, and if you go to my website, you can see all the novels I have too. My space opera is out and available, the first three books. So, you know, I hope people will also read my other work as well. Absolutely. Check it out. And there's also uh, a charity that you have going on where if people donate to certain charities, you will send them a book. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, yeah, if they make a $25 donation to any one of the charities that are listed on my Doing Good section of my website, uh, just let me know what book you want. I will sign it and send it to you at no charge to you, <laughs> other than the fact you've made a charitable donation. Um, I will give you a book. So. Oh. That's I'm pretty cool. To, That's about yeah, the best way you could get a book. When I can get home to get to my stash of books, <laughs> um, because right now I'm in LA, you know, camping out doing screenwriting, and I only get to go home once in a while. So, but no, I, um, I love to encourage people, and I also on my Facebook page, um, I have a great group on Facebook, and I also have you know a donation button there for the World Wildlife Fund, and so um, we do what we can, light a candle. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank well, you very much for motivating people that way. I think it's yes. important in uh, this day and age, for sure. You certainly <laughs> helped us chase away the darkness tonight. Oh, well, yeah. thank you. You guys take care, and I hope we get to meet in person at some time. That would be wonderful. I would love that. Uh, thank you I'll so bring much. the horses over. I got a trailer and everything. Okay. <laughs> Sounds like a deal. <laughs> All, right. All right. Well, take care. Thanks, you thank guys. You. Yep. Bye-bye. 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 Wow, thanks again, Melinda Snodgrass, for joining us. That was uh, just such a fun conversation, and we learned so much. I, personally, am going to go get my notebooks, and I'm going to look at my ideas that I had many, many years ago and see if I can do anything with them. Uh, Melinda Snodgrass also famously wrote the episode Pen Pals. I am going to now become Pen Pals with Melinda M. Snodgrass. Do you think she would break the Prime Directive to talk to you? Oh, for me? I think she would follow her heart. And no. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Mike, how can saying our no. uh, millions of fans get uh, in touch with us? They can go to the Twitter or the Instagram at Making It So Pod. Don't we? We have an email address. We also have an email address, which is Making It So Pod at gmail.com. Making It So Pod, P O D, at gmail.com. That's two yeah. episodes in a row, right? Thanks for listening, and we'll come. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. We're working on uh, we're working on our guest list, and we will have some fascinating people to talk to going forward. Absolutely, we've got some really uh, great people lined up uh, moving forward. And as always, get in touch with us if you would like to be on the show. Well, if you worked on Trek and know somebody who worked on Trek, or you just want to talk to us, I guess I'd I'd talk to you. For a little bit. Yeah, sure. Maybe uh, maybe if you uh, have a... Uh, oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs> well, well, you come, uh, you, they come up in here talking to that corn pone. I don't want to talk to him now. Dang old, dang old, dang old. Exactly. We, there's no room for that here. I'm so sorry. No, this is all getting cut. Yes. All right, so... <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us, and stay safe out there. Kapla. It has been made so. Thanks for listening. Live long and prosper. Make it so.